Well, welcome everybody to today's HydroTerra webinar. It's great to see so many of you here today. Really appreciate your presence. Today, we've got a absolute specialist in climate change and really hydrology. So the, today's topic is about how climate change is affecting flood planning and design and certainly a very timely presentation. So our presenter today is Dr. Conrad Wasco and I've got some information about him shortly. All right, there's a picture of Conrad and you can see him live as well. Uh, he's from the University of Melbourne. Before we get into Conrad's details, we love your questions. And uh, it's a big part of these webinars. So in order for you to ask a question, we ask that you type it in the Q&A section, uh, which is at the top of your screen. And at the end of this, I will read out the questions and we will do your best, we'll do our best to answer those questions for you. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? We're pretty passionate about sharing knowledge and certainly this is a topic where we should be sharing knowledge as broadly as possible because there's some real challenges that need to be solved. We like to facilitate education. We feel that we provide a sort of supplementary to perhaps some of the university style education, a bit more applied on the ground. And we like to be adopting a sort of leadership position in industry, helping industry to face up to some of the challenges of the time. The webinar today, part one, we're just about through. I'm just about to introduce Conrad. Part two is broken into two parts. Conrad's section about how climate change is affecting flood planning and design. And then topic two, I'm going to just raise awareness of some of the really good monitoring networks that we have in Australia that a lot of Conrad's uh, research is dependent upon. Finally, part three, which uh, is an ever-growing part of our webinars, is the Q&A section where we do our best to answer your queries. So a bit about our speaker today. Firstly, thanks very much, Conrad, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, Conrad is an ARC DECRA Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Conrad has over 10 years of experience in both consulting and research. Conrad's been pretty successful in this area. He has won numerous awards, including, good Lord, Conrad, what's that abbreviation? Stand uh, large for? M stands for um, modelling, yeah, M stands. Let's just go with that. <laughs> okay. Early Career Research Excellent Award, the Victorian Fellowship, and the Lawrence G. Straub Award for Best PhD Thesis Globally in Water Engineering. He has contributed to the current national guidelines on flood estimation and his current research focuses on understanding the effects of climate change on hydrology and specifically extreme events. So without further ado, I will hand over to Conrad and uh, I feel very lucky to have you here at this particular time when we're dealing with so many floods, Conrad. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think just a few things I wanted to say probably up front. Um, one is that this seminar might raise more questions than answers, um, but I hope that it sort of forms, um, I guess, a bit of a backbone of understanding where the science is at. Uh, I'm, I worked as an engineer for, for four years at the Water Research Laboratory um, in New South Wales. Uh, if you're familiar, it's, it's opposite the Manly Hydraulics laboratory, MHL, um, the government um, organised department there. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I am passionate about translating research into guidance. Uh, I'm not going to say that I'm the best at it. Um, and, and you'll see in the slide that it, it, is, it is a challenging space. Uh, this presentation, uh, I also presented to Engineers Australia so a few weeks ago. So just, just so you know, there's, there's a lot of information that, that will overlap with that presentation. Uh, thanks, Richard. So just to start off, I guess we want to talk about um, 
guidance. And so where is our current guidance? So if you go to uh, ARNR and you look at the chapter on climate change guidance, then the, the stipulation there is for every temperature degree of temperature increase, um, we factor our IFDs by 5%. And so if we go to the next slide, um, and hopefully if you click forward one, you'll see that this is really what we're saying is, well, if we have our flood magnitude or rainfall on, on the y-axis and our the rarity of the event on the uh, x-axis, well, we've got our flood frequency curve, let's say, and we apply 5% change and, and everything else stays constant, and we probably expect a future flood frequency curve to increase by that 5% per degree Celsius. But why is it tapering? Well, there isn't any guidance to factor the PMPs. So uh, which is the problem maximum of precipitation, the really, really extreme on, on the right-hand side. So we've got a little bit of a discontinuity there, but this is where our current guidance uh, is at. So I've, I've got this slide. There's a lot of information on this, and I've, I've adapted this from the ARNR guidance. And there's a really important point here to make. So the top panel is, again, a flood frequency curve. I, I think you know we, we're familiar with this type of curve um, as the event becomes more rare and the flood magnitude goes up. And so we have our design flood estimate, but there's multiple methods that engineers, practitioners use for, for design. If we have data, we might use flood frequency analysis. Um, some, some practitioners will use continuous simulation. I think it's probably more common in the UK from my um, experience. Um, but really, you know, if, if we're designing a dam infrastructure, we need estimates of the PMP, but usually we're using IFD curves and, and we're putting that through some sort of rainfall runoff um, our model, and then it goes into our, say, you know, two-flow mic hydraulic model. So really, most of um, practice is, is in the IFD modeling space. So if we click forward, the research space or the state of the science really is in that blue section. Um, if, if, you, if you read the literature, there is a lot being done on non-stationary flood frequency analysis. I mean, what does that mean? mean it just means that we're trying to make our flood frequency curves change with time and with, with, with climate change. But also climate science tends to look at the 99th percentile, not of an, you know, when we say 99th percentile, we usually have an annual maxima series. So that would be something like a 1% event. But often climate science is looking at the 99th percentile of all daily events. So, so we're talking something that occurs once every couple of years. So the blue part is where the science really is at, and the red part is probably, you know, where most um, design is focused. And so, um, you know, we can say that, you know, I'm part of the problem, right? Like there is a disconnect there um, between the science and engineering practice. And it is something that I really am passionate about trying to fill. And I'm going to try and put in context the science, but in, in, the, in the engineering context in the next slides. So in terms of event, um, I, like, so overseas they call it a IF, IFD um, analysis, but here I guess we call it event-based um, analysis. So we know that we need to put in um, IFDs. And so the, the science is saying that, well, our storm intensities are going to increase. We also need to factor, um, we put in temporal patterns. So these temporal patterns, it looks like they're becoming more picky around Australia, more towards convective events. And that has an impact on the spatial pattern as well. If you're using space time patterns in your design, sea level rise is in increasing, so that increases the tail water. If you're doing hydraulic modeling. Um, there is evidence now that antecedent precipitation events, so mean rainfalls are decreasing. So we're having drier soils, we're having um, more uh, possibly than airspace in our reservoirs before it actually rains and floods. Now, I'm not saying that you have to take all this into account when you design. That, that's not the point, but um, it's, it's just to say there is a lot of uncertainty and, and we need to figure out what are the important bits that we're going to, I guess, consider in terms of climate change. So next slide. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and you can move forward. Um, just perfect. Thank you. So I think I put this slide in um, because I really wanted to convey that, um, and this is something that I think we're all already familiar with in terms of, um, or we have a good feel for as engineers, but in terms of, um, you know, 
what is our flood risk and what's happening with climate change. And the, the top, these are just binomial probabilities, right? Like, so if you have a 1% event, you know, you're tossing the coin every year, but it's got a one in a hundred chance of, of landing on a, on a flood. But what, what isn't conveyed, I think, to the public is that, um, okay, you know, that in a given year, maybe there's a 1% chance, but if you look over the lifetime of your, your structure, 100 years, then there's a 63% chance that you'll have one or more floods that are that size or larger. Or what's highlighted there is a 26% chance of two or more floods. So, you know, we're, we're actually betting our infrastructure on, on failing, you know, with a quite substantial risk when we design to this one in 100 flood. There is evidence, um, and it's a very rough rule of thumb that the one in 100 year flood might become the one in 30 flood with, with climate change. And so then we're talking about, you know, if you look at that, that right hand column, you're going to say something like, well, the, you know, you've sort of got an 80, um, a, a 24% chance of seeing five or more of those floods, right? Or a 43% chance of seeing four or more of those floods. So actually the the chances of seeing quite rare events is increasing substantially with, with climate change. And it's just something we need to factor in. And if we go to the next slide, um, you know, I think even with the questions that have come in um, this morning, I, I'd like to think it's fair to say, and, and the conferences that I've been to, you know, people have assets that, that they're worried about how to design for and how to protect with climate change. And currently the guidance isn't necessarily factoring, factoring in all the possible changes. And so what has happened is um, these um, corporations have funded um, Rory, Shish, myself and the people, and we've used, um, so at the University of New South Wales and the University of Melbourne, and we've used that to fund um, PhD students and postdocs to do research um, to try and investigate how exactly climate change will affect their, their dam assets. Now, I won't be presenting much of the research from that particular work, but I really want to acknowledge their funding. That's one thing. But it's also a really good example of how, you know, I think this is a, a topic that people are, are concerned about and, and want to see um, more guidance around how we design for, for climate change. So the first thing is that um, we're faced, unfortunately, with this problem, which is called um, in science, uh, deep uncertainty. Um, and on the x-axis, I've got the time, the year, on the y-axis is the persisting dew point, which is actually the dew point temperature that is used in probable maximum precipitation estimates. The different colours are the different scenarios that are modelled in, in, in climate change, um, in, in climate change models. And the point is that the, the four curves um, there are, are di diverging, right? So we don't really know what path we're on. And so we're, we're in a position where we, we design based on a station, stationary assumption that the climate won't change, but we don't even know how the climate is going to change. So there's a very good argument um, for our guidance and, and our infrastructure to be continually updated. We don't actually know what trajectory we're going to go on. Uh, Next slide, thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, so the first sort of avenue of, I think, evidence that I want to say that we have for climate change, and this is very much now summarising where the science is at, um, is a thermodynamic relationship. And, and it's as simple as, you know, if you've got increased greenhouse gases, um, you've got more warming um, as the temperature gets warmer, the moisture, um, the atmosphere can hold more moisture. I sometimes think of it as just like a, a, a boiling kettle, right? You have more um, water molecules in, in the vapor phase than, than the water phase. Increasing temperatures mean increasing evaporation. So we've got increasing moisture content in the atmosphere. And, and there's a very strong physical relationship there. It's approximated to 7% per degree Celsius. Um, so we know that with increasing temperatures, the atmosphere can store more moisture, and if it rains, then we'll get larger um, or greater extreme rainfalls. Uh, next slide. So if, you know, if we know that there's this relationship, then we can actually use historical data. So this is data that the Bureau of Meteorology collects that we use. Um, and this is a paper done by uh, our PhD student. So we can actually look at these 
precipitation temperature relationships in our historical data. So if we go to the next slide, look, there's a lot going on here and, and, and I'll, I'll give the take home message um, in words, but the top left panel is uh, all the pluvio sites. So all the sub daily rainfall sites that we found we could use uh, for, our, for our research. And the next slide, the next four panels, sorry, the next three panels here, the colors correspond to the climate zones in, in that first uh, top left panel. And what we have on the y-axis is that relationship with temperature that we're observing in our extreme rainfalls, 99th percentile. So not terribly extreme, right? We're still talking um, things that occur quite frequently, but 99th percentile relationship with temperature. And on the x-axis is the duration of the event. And the point here is that looking at our observational records at the association of rainfall with temperature, we see for short duration rainfalls, so let's say hourly, on average, there is a seven to 10% uh, increase in the rainfall per degree increase in temperature. So our historical records are pointing to, probably sounding like a broken record, increases in extreme rainfalls with increasing temperature. But it's, it's interesting to note that you can see, particularly in the warm temperate area, so the bottom right-hand panel, that's where we have most of our data on the, on the coastal regions around um, uh, Southeast Australia, um, there's a decline with, with increasing duration. So, and that's important to note. So longer duration rainfalls are less likely to, to increase. Uh, so the next slide. Um, and I really want to say that there's, you know, there's other bits of, of evidence, right? And again, we're just looking at historical data here. And this is some work um, I, I've, I've met this um, academic, uh, she's, she's in the UK, her name is Selma. Um, oh, perfect. And, and what she did was she took our uh, Australian historical data again from the Bureau of Meteorology and split it in half. So she's gone from 1966 to 2013, split it in half on, at 1990, and then looked at the difference between those two slices. And what she found was if she divided that by the, the temperature increase that has happened over that time, historically, um, the magnitude of extreme daily rainfalls increased around 7%. Hourly rainfall increases are much higher up to about two times the rate of 7%. So we have this evidence that um, even historically, if we just look at trends, um, we're, we're seeing increases in our, in our extreme rainfalls. Uh, next slide. Um, and the last sort of um, bit of evidence that I really want to probably talk about is, um, you know, a lot of people use climate models. Uh, I, I, I don't, I focus on historical data, but this is data that we, that we, we use um, to assess how climate is changing. And this is work done out of the University of New South Wales. But again, even if we run our climate models out um, into the future, as I was showing with those, with those projection curves, one of the earlier slides, and we divide that uh, increase in rainfall out to the future, out to 2100 by the temperature increase. Again, we're looking at about 6% increases in our uh, daily extreme rainfalls. What was interesting in this study was they looked at more extreme rainfalls and found an in even greater increase. So I can summarize three points here in words, which is uh, extreme rainfalls increase with increasing temperature, shorter duration rainfalls are more likely to increase, but also the more extreme the rainfall, the, the more likely it is to increase. Uh, so next slide. And finally, um, thank you. So what's happening at the far, far, far end? Well, with the PMPs, well, the, the, the problem maximum precipitation really depends on how much moisture you can store in the atmosphere. And this picture, this blue color, it's just a correlation between the precipitable water. This is from observations and dew point temperature globally. So this is actually using um, data that's measured by, by satellites now. But again, really strong correlation. So the point is, if you've got increasing dew point temperatures, which is what we're using to design our PMPs, and they're increasing, then we have more moisture in the atmosphere. And so PMPs will, will increase uh, as well. So if we go to the next slide, we're moving from a situation which looks like this to, if we click forward, you know, it, it probably looks like this. Well, the extreme rainfalls are increasing across um, uh, regardless of, of the rarity. So moving forward, thank you. Now to put things in, in sort of greater context, well, you know, I, I've really talked about rainfall through this, this whole, whole time. Uh, and probably what we're interested in is flooding, 
So, so to start talking about flooding, we need to start talking about runoff. And this is using actually, um, there's a lot of details that are missing here. And it's actually probably really important to point out that this modeling work is based on a model called AURA-L. And this is actually run by the Bureau of Meteorology. It's a water balance model that's run across Australia. Now the rainfall is on the left-hand panel is observed gridded rainfall. And this is from 1960 to current. If you haven't seen this before, it's worth noting that in the tropics, extreme rainfall, um, sorry, in the tropics, rainfalls are increasing on, on average across Australia. But in the southern parts of Australia, particularly on the coast, our, our mean rainfalls are declining. So what that actually means is that we're having um, drier soils um, when it rains. So our antecedent um, conditions, I guess, are less. Our soils are drier, our losses are larger when it rains. So that's the middle panel. And, and we've got less runoff. We've actually got less water in our river systems um, uh, before a large rainfall event occurs. So next slide. So we've got, um, we've got soil moisture declining. The other thing worth noting, um, and this was using a global data set, but storm durations are also decreasing. Okay, so we're looking at possibly a shift to shorter and peakier um, storms, which is what this slide is. The red color is just the trend in the storm duration and it's getting shorter. Again, looking just using historical uh, data. And this is some work actually out of the Bureau of Meteorology that I've, I've pinched for this presentation. Yeah. Um, the author, the lead author is uh, Acacia Pepler. Um, and what she did was she actually looked at uh, storm types. So she went a, a, a step further than what I, I did in the previous work, which is just looking at storm durations in general. But she split um, the left and the right panel are the, the different um, seasons. And so again, she has plotted the changes in our total Rainfall, so you can see um, in the winter months, which is when we get most of our rainfall in southern um, parts of Australia, um, you can see you know we're trending to drier conditions. But the point here is that she's taken these four regions. Um, so it's southwest West Australia, around Perth, southeast Australia, that blue one, the green one, the eastern seaboard, and Tasmania. And if we click to the next slide, there is a whole lot of information here. And again, I just have to summarize it um, in words, but C stands for cyclone, F stands for front, T stands for thunderstorm. So what Acacia has done and her team, um, they, they managed to classify the weather events and look at the historical trends in those, in those four regions. And what they actually found was the amount of rainfall which is on the y-axis, the amount of rainfall that you get on average, it's changing based on the frequency of these uh, and magnitude of these events. So we're actually getting, um, so if the bars are above zero, what we're seeing is, and they're, the, they're usually the red ones, we're seeing more rainfall coming from thunderstorm-related events and less rainfall coming from front-related events. So again, all this evidence is pointing to the fact that we're getting you know, probably bigger gaps between our events. We're getting drier soils. When the event actually comes, it's shorter and, and it's peakier. So, so what's the impact on runoff? So that's that's really where we're going with this. So that's the next slide. Um, so what we have here is on the uh, y-axis I've got, well, these are, again, historical trends, and I've used um, data that Richard will, will present at the end to, to come up with this plot. I've averaged across Australia. Right, trying to um, really try and extrapolate out to as far as I could take the record. So I've gotten to up to one in 40 year events. Um, but on average, um, extreme rainfalls are increasing across Australia and the more rare they are, the more they're increasing. But stream flows are not. So this is the final sort of implication for flooding. And, and, and the reason is if we click forward, it's because we've got these declines in soil moisture. So what, what's sort of happening is, you know, for your frequent flooding, frequent flooding, I'm talking like one in two, one in five, um, the increase in, in, in extreme rainfalls is not large enough to offset the fact that we have drier soils, shorter storm durations, and, and our floods are not actually increasing. But it's for those really rare events. I mean, you can appreciate it, it's, it's very much what we're seeing now, right? But if you get a lot of rainfall, everything gets saturated, 
when it rains, everything turns into runoff. And so indeed for you know events one above, you know, you're one in 40, moving forwards to one in a hundred, then well indeed um, increases in extreme rainfalls correspond to increases in flooding. And again, this is just using historical data. So on the next slide, really what I'm trying to say is that rather than this, um, if we click forward, this is probably sort of what we're looking at in terms of our future flood frequency curves. You know, extreme events are going up, um, PMPs are probably going up, um, and those um, PMPs going up will lead to greater probable maximum flooding, EMFs. Um, but you're, you're, you're more, uh, Rory likes to use garden variety um, flooding, you know, your more frequent events. Um, they're quite likely to be decreasing with climate change um, because we've had, at least in Australia, Australia experienced, particularly in the southern parts, large decreases in our mean rainfalls and, and the soils are dry before it rains. So where I want to go to now is um, there's only a handful of slides left, but I want to say I, I hope that that has sort of given you a flavour for the science um, and hopefully in, in, a, in a relatable um, way. Um, and what we found was, again, like I'm... I am passionate about translating science into practice, um, and it's not it's not easy to do. Um, so one of the things that we did was like I was I was reading the literature a few years ago, and and I really couldn't find anything in the in the scientific literature that really reviewed the flood guidance from around the world from from really a practitioner's perspective. So so teaming up with a few people from around the world, and and um, we looked at what we could find in terms of flood guidance from around the world. And I really just want to present these as examples just so that we're all sort of on the same page of, well, what, what's happening around the world in terms of design flood guidance. So the first example I have um, is from, I think it's from New Zealand. It'll be the next slide. And, and oh, no, sorry, I wanted to say um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy. A lot of research is behind paywalls. Just, just email me. Right. Okay. I'm very happy to always always share things if, if you're interested. Um, so the first example is New Zealand, and what they've done is they've used those those climate models um, without going into too much detail, but converted those climate models into some sort of scaling factors for their IFTs. And here you can see the different colours, the different event durations, and you've got on the y um, on the y axis that percentage change that they're applying, and on the x axis how rare the event is. And so this is really nice because these curves you can see they're sort of increasing and tapering off. So the more rare the event, the greater the increase. But you can also see that blue one. So for two, um, sorry, for hourly rainfalls, they're saying, look, we're probably going to factor this by by twelve percent. Um, but for the long duration rainfalls, looking about five to to seven percent. Uh, so on the next slide. Um, the UK has gone down a different line, and this is actually, I think, the second iteration of their, their climate change factors. Again, um, just factoring IFD curves, uh, again, using climate models. I'm not, I'm not I'm, you know, I'm not trying to push for any particular way that people do things, but I'm just trying to present the literature. Um, but they've done a little bit differently. Rather than doing temperature sensitivities, they've actually said, look, like we've, we've had a look um, at, at our climate models. We're going to give you gridded factors. So they're, they're spatially varying. So the ones for the New, New Zealand, they don't take into account where you are. These vary with, with space. They, they call them uplift factors. And they've said, look, we're going to have factors for 2050, 2070, specific ARIs and specific durations. Uh, so next slide. Uh, and the last... Oh, Example uh, on the it, this is actually for Canada, so my, my apologies. Um, but uh, they've actually got like a little web portal. I, I, some academics um, did, um, and you can actually click and you can come up with uh, IFD curves again for any of those future scenario curves that I showed uh, at the start. So they actually process all the climate data for you and come up with with some IFD curves for you for for whatever scenario you're you're interested in. Uh, and one more next slide. Look, and I wanted to present this, you know, there, there are other alternatives. So the thing is that all, all I presented was we're still, everyone's, uh, we're all looking at factoring IFDs, but um, what if you want to do continuous simulation? And this is, again, an example of where, you know, we needed a bespoke solution because there wasn't uh, necessarily guidance around this. So um, working with with Hark uh, for, um, uh, for Melbourne Water, we came up with these climate change factors uh, that they can use into this. Um, 
sewer design networks. And, and this is because they're using continuous simulation. So we can't just factor the IFDs. We need to factor the entire rainfall time series. So what we came up with was, well, um, look, this is a bit obscure, this graph, understand. So again, just in words, um, let's factor those extreme rainfalls up by a lot more than the less extreme rainfalls. And so what then happens is we can make our mean rainfalls decline, our extreme rainfalls go up, and our storm patterns become peakier. So it's, it's just a simple sort of you know, a, a scaling factor that actually just depends on how, how rare the, the event is. And that worked for their continuous simulation. So moving forward, um, you know, what we came up with, and this is us as, as scientists, so very happy to be um, uh, contradicted on this, but as part of that, that review paper, we came up with these three sort of overarching principles. Um, you know, I think there is often reticence um, maybe I didn't use that word properly, but maybe reluctance, I guess, to, um, you know, to adopt climate change in, in our work. Um, and, and, that, and that's fair enough because there's a lot of uncertainty. But actually what I hope I communicated here is that uh, there are multiple lines of evidence for climate change and they're all pointing in the same direction. So one thing that we really need to start doing as an academic community, to be honest, is um, communicating consensus. Okay, we all need to show that we're on the same page and that doesn't always happen um quite often you know um yeah in uh, in public forums um you know people will, will argue and, and, and um, disagree with each other but we really need to be communicating consensus and i think that would help a lot um the guidance that we provide needs to be practical so i, I think it's you know it's fair to say that again a lot of the academic literature which i didn't he focuses on flood frequency analysis, which, you know, we often don't use in practice because we don't have um, data at, at where, where we design. Um, and again, that the science is moving so fast. I mean, this is um, an incredibly fast moving space. So, you know, I appreciate the ARNR gu guidelines were updated recently. And all of a sudden we're talking about updating the, the climate change guidance again. It, it is a fast moving space. And so it, and updates are hard to do. Um, so there needs to be a way of doing these things that, that makes them easily um, updatable. Um, so having said that, um, next slide. Um, yeah, I, I was really fortunate um, to be contacted by Dr. Ramona de la Posa um, from DQ. Um, so the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water. And um, I asked her to um, present me with a slide which I could incorporate into this, this presentation. And uh, they are commencing an 18-month project um, to actually look at updating the Chapter 6 uh, of the ARNR, uh, the, the, the flood guidance for the climate change. So if you have um, any questions or are interested in the updates, uh, you, you should feel very comfortable um, contacting Dr. Ramona. It is uh, it is really exciting to hear that, you know, there is um, movement forward in this space that, you know, and, and I want to say, I think, you know, again, based on the questions, based on the conferences that I go to, it's like people are listening, you know, like I, I appreciate that um, we don't necessarily know how to design. Um, we know that, you know, we want to protect our infrastructure assets and, and we need to do this in the best way possible and, and you know, and, yeah, there is work being done to, to move this space forward. So I think with, with that, um, my, my little mumbling there, um, I'm, I'm going to say thank you and, and really appreciate uh, you having me to, to present to you. Thanks very much, Conrad. That was excellent. Um, just in case any of you have any doubts about uh, the veracity of Conrad's data that supports his work. I thought I would uh, provide you with a little bit of background of what Australia is doing very well in terms of monitoring uh, the important data around climate change so we can get this right. So this is our Australian Climate Change Site Network. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this before, but uh, it was, for me, it was the first time as I put these slides together. But I guess the first take home message is there's quite a lot of sites, right? And uh, uh, talking to Conrad uh, just before this webinar, he said that we're probably third best in the world behind the UK and the US in terms of monitoring networks. So 
we've got a right to be proud in the investment we've put into running that. And big thank you to the Bureau of Meteorology for keeping that network going. So we should feel confident about when people tell us there is change happening, that we have a really strong Australian context around that. Um, so just looking at this network, this network picks up daily temperature, daily rainfall, monthly rainfall, monthly pan evaporation, and monthly cloud amount. And if you want more details on that network, you can go to the Bureau of Meteorology site and uh, there's a wealth of information on not only the, uh, the data, but how it's um, homogenized and that sort of thing to remove errors, et cetera. So really uh, impressed with what we've got on the ground in Australia. Similar to that, I thought, you know, we've been hearing a lot about sea level uh, in terms of climate change and our needs to ad ad adapt to that. But I thought, gee, I wonder how they keep an eye on that. And once again, the Bureau of Meteorology has a pretty big network around Australia um, of what they call these sea frame stations. Uh, so there's 14 of those plus a couple of extra supplementary stations that are run by a couple of uh, ports. Um, and that data is used to provide us with that level of accuracy, which is honestly extreme, uh, looking at small changes in sea level. And it's, it's not an easy task. Um, and the, the, the levels of rise that they're trying to pick up are sort of around, you know, 0.4 millimetres per year. And if you imagine what's going on with sea and how often it's still enough to get that sort of accuracy, it's quite a challenge. And with those sort of tolerances, they also need to be very careful about ground movements themselves, right? So there's there's that aspect too. So they have this global navigation satellite system to provide them with a sort of independent uh, survey of the elevations of those sites. So really a big investment and impressive. And uh, being a bit of a monitoring obsessive myself, I had a little bit more of a look at these stations. And this is what they look like. So you can see, uh, particularly on this right-hand side, where they've got these tubes that they mount their sensors in, that they've done a fair bit of work here to try and avoid some of the wave action complexities that come in. Uh, you'll see there's a bit of a sort of lateral structure there, which presumably is to reduce this sort of suction effect that you get as a wave moves past, which translates to your water level in the in the stilling well but there's also a bunch of other things being used to measure level at the same time okay so there's an acoustic sensor that's looking at the water level in the stilling well but you've got pressure sensors over here they've also got a temperature sensor they've got radar looking down as well so really they've got three different methods they're all going on at once to look at the levels. So I thought that was pretty impressive. So a large network, well, large 16 sites around Australia, uh, pretty impressive investment there too. Once again, the uh, Bureau of Meteorology, I believe, has some involvement in that. Um, but if you want more details on that, you can have a look at the Australian Baseline Sea Level Monitoring Project. Lastly, I thought I'd have a look at the hydrological stations, which is obviously probably the most pertinent data to what Conrad's been talking about today. Um, we have a national network of 467 stations around Australia, and those dots on that map uh, show you where those stations are. And they're providing us with plenty of stream flow data for this sort of research to be undertaken. And the Bureau of Meteorology has a role of making sure we pull all that data together. Various state agencies are involved in maintaining those gauging sites. So um, really impressive spread of sites that we're monitoring there as well. And without those sites, you know, Conrad wouldn't be able to do the research he does. So 
I was honestly really impressed with the coverage we have. So without further ado, we're going to move to initially just a couple of takeaways. I guess my takeaways on, uh, on this topic today. You know, obviously we've got changing meteorological conditions, right, that uh, are becoming more and more clear and I really like the way Conrad sort of extrapolated backwards to, with historical data rather than just using sort of modelled projections. So that's pretty powerful. But that's only part of the picture, you know, really uh, in terms of what generates floods, it's obviously intensity but in the rainfall, but it's also your catchment characteristics. And you would have seen a few webinars that we've run in the past, like with the Maloon Institute, where they're looking at restoring some of those barriers to rapid stream flow down highly degraded streams and that sort of thing to retard some of the flows further up the catchment. So there's a lot of things that can be done and a lot of them relate to catchment characteristics. Um, next take home message is there are multiple lines of evidence for the impacts of climate change. And really, as Conrad said, there's consensus around now. So really the debate needs to, to move off. Is it happening to what are we going to do about it? And I think that's what Conrad's really focusing on is how can we get this adopted? How can we get this being used? And that's obviously really important. Um, there are many methods used by engineers to design and any climate change guidance needs to be able to be, I guess, integrated into those methods. Um, now, for a long time now, we've been doing various projections and uh, you know, I used to get involved sometimes with some planning approval processes and you'd have the sort of projections of what's going to happen with climate change. And quite often it wasn't actually that, that listened to, right? We would still go ahead with the various developments. So we are going to have to start thinking and applying this stuff with more conviction now, it seems to be real, right? Um, as scientific understanding is improving rapidly, guidance should also be updated rapidly. Um, certainly is an amazingly rapidly changing place. And some of the work that's being done, like that AURA-L um, projection of antecedent soil moisture across the whole of the country at a daily time step and that sort of thing is, is really um, impressive. You might remember Paul Fakemer from the Bureau of Meteorology presenting on that uh, a couple of months ago in one of our webinars. But uh, that sort of information needs to be translated into design processes, in my opinion. Um, Australia has a impressive range of measurement networks, and I've just shown you a sample of those. And the Bureau of Meteorology has a lot of responsibilities around those measurements. So we're lucky to have the Bureau. Right, on to the Q&A, which is a favourite part of our webinars, I believe. First and foremost, fantastic to have so many early bird questions. I, I believe Conrad now is the record holder for the number of early bird questions. So first question uh, for Conrad, is there any case studies or examples that you can share with us about financial impact on businesses or landholders? in response to climate change. Yeah, and so this is where I'm like, short answer is no, um, which, which is unfortunate. But yeah, it, and it's mainly because it's just not work that I um, have been involved with. But I, I would be surprised, I would be surprised if there wasn't um, consulting work that has has looked at this, but it's not through through the contacts that I, I have. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't know if Richard, you have any any insights that are greater than mine. No, no you can own this one, Conrad. <laughs> Next question: I'm interested in the effects on hydrology in rivers with regional areas and the interaction with stream regulation. Yeah, so there is. Um, uh, I wonder point to um, colleagues that, that we have here at, at the University of Melbourne. So I am in particular interested in, in extreme events. Um, 
flooding, um, but there's a, a whole group here um, that look at trying to best use, you know, essentially manage as best they can um, the the regulation of the rivers in, in the Murray-Darling Basin um, and trying to move uh, towards how best we can do that. And, and there's a lot of interesting research out there because it actually turns out that um, uh, natural regions actually respond very well often to um, or uh, a lot of fish species and things like that. They need certain pulses of rainfall, um, certain pulses of stream flow at certain times. So there's actually a lot of interaction between, you know, these, these sort of, let's say, frequent flood events and how uh, the ecosystem, uh, you know, the health of the ecosystem. So, so there's actually a, a lot um, a lot of research in that in that space trying to how how best we can actually regulate our our, our rivers um, in terms of achieving both you know the the outcomes for I guess meeting irrigator needs um, but as well as um, managing the ecological health health of the the systems and and indeed um, I want to say that the federal government acknowledges this there has been a a, a uh, a centre for for research um, just recently funded um, between multiple universities around Australia and government organisations, and we're talking um, millions of dollars over the next uh, ten years to actually try and uh, manage the health of, of the Murray Darling Basin. So that um, that CRC is called the uh, One Basin. So if if you if you Google One Basin, um, you'll you'll find that they're they're just starting up uh, and, and investigating that more. And Hydroterra is one of the partners of, of the One Basin. So oh. thanks for that plug. <laughs> yeah, that is it's it's an amazing um, uh, from from a very personal point of view. I, I think in, as far as CRC goes, go that is probably the most partners that have ever come together. So just this recognition that um, that everyone's on board is is just um, yeah really really impressive and, and yeah yeah. You should be very yeah. You should be congratulated on 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 that. Um, just on a technical matter, so I was involved in a project several years ago looking at um, uh, Western Australian catchments and just the potential effects of um, climate change on Western Australia's water supplies. And, and one thing that uh, is a concern is, uh, and, and you sort of had it in your early slides, was, you know, what happens to runoff as we have reduced antecedent soil moisture content? And a lot of the Western Australian streams in the area I was looking at, you know, you have a base flow contribution, which is very saline, and you have an interflow and a surface runoff flow that's... Uh, you know, fresh, relatively fresh, and those stream systems are really dependent on having that ratio of um, fresher water to, to the base flow contribution being at a point where the, the salinity doesn't get too high. Uh, and with, with the projections of reduced runoff, obviously that's a problem, uh, base flow contributions increasing relative to those more fresh water um, runoff sources. So it's a complicated area, um, that's for sure. And uh, some of the implications from climate change are going to be poorer water quality in, in some of those drainage lines, right? Um, better keep moving forward. What considerations in engineering for psych, social, mental health on people from flooding? Uh I, I love this question because I, I would be surprised if there's any particular literature out there or that's that's Australia focused. Um, I've, I've just been recently uh, talking uh, to a colleague here, Anna Kosovich, who's uh, more of a social scientist, and there is just um, so are there any formal considerations? I doubt it, and you know, should we be formally considering these things? Probably. I mean. I want to say, and it goes to sort of the nature-based solution question later, um, the sense of community is really important. People don't want to move from, from their floodplain. They don't want to move from their community. And, and these things are just so critical. And 
I'm just not really aware of any any sort of research or, or considerations that, that that are given to this. So I think it's just a really important thing that should be um, or needs to be considered in moving forward. And, and just this recognition that engineering is, uh, I like building things, but engineering uh, needs, floodplain management is as much about social science as it is about engineering, but uh, I think the engineering gets more, more of a focus. And so I think that's fair to acknowledge. All right, next question, Conrad. ARR 2019 versus ARR 2016, best practice implementation versus good practice implementation. I, so I must confess, I don't know what this is exactly referring to. I'm wondering whether there was a change in the wording between the two and is maybe that's what the uh, question is referring to, but I don't. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know specifically what, what, the, what the difference uh, is between those two uh, AR and R versions, I must confess. Did, is there a, an adoption within ARR 2019 of some of the stuff you're seeing in terms of climate change? Or? Yeah, so I think that was one of the pleasing things um, that, that came out of um, ANCOLD. Uh, I, I wanna say that uh, there are agencies that are adopting the 5% the and climate change guidance and looking at the sensitivities of their design to that. And, and that's just fantastic to see. And, and I mean, <laughs> I hope it's okay to say, I think, you know, my interpretation of the presentation was also like, mm, we have a problem and, and we, we, you know, we don't, you know, this increases uh, the, the flood risks to our infrastructure. And, okay, so now what do we do about it was, was the next question. And there wasn't necessarily an answer to that. But it was really promising and encouraging to see uh, the implementation of the guidance because there has been research done and not, not everyone does, which is, which is um, yeah, so it was encouraging to see that. Good answer. Uh, next question, design flood factors to be considered for climate. I think you touched on that in your presentation. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think um, we, we have, uh, a factoring for for IFD curves in in our flood guidance and and I I, I guess you know I'm arguing for the fact that that should probably vary with severity and duration um, to be more consistent with with the current science. So yeah. Okay. Um, adjustments of intensity, duration, frequency. IDF that were established based on old records. Yeah, I, I mean, I wanted to probably say a few things on this point. Um, uh, to calculate um, the IFDs um, is, is no small task. To QA um, all, all the data across Australia, a lot of it was hand QA'd. I mean, they were looking at extreme rainfall records and then going back to the radar and trying to see whether the things, were, whether the events were plausible. It was, it was a mammoth undertaken by the Bureau of Meteorology. And so this notion to um, update IFDs regularly is, is um, an ideal world we would, but it, it, is, it is a massive uh, undertaking. Yeah, so... Um, you know, do the records incorporate some sort of non-stationary in them? Well, I mean, they're historical records, so quite possibly extreme rainfalls have increased. And, and again, the argument um, that I want to say is that, you know, that 5%, that, that, was, that was the best that we had a few years ago, you know, like when that was originally written, which was 2016. The original projects that were done for ARR &R were done uh, early, 20, uh, I mean, I was involved in some of them, so we're talking like 2010, around that time. So yeah, you know, it's been it's been ten to, you know, let's say ten to fifteen years. So so the science has moved uh, forward, and and that's that's hopefully what was um, I hope was conveyed in in this presentation. Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> what design events? This is a good question. What design events should we be using to design structures and systems? Um. There, there, I can't put my finger on the government report now, um, but there was a government report that was put out um, after, I think, the Queensland floods um, and looking at reviewing uh, design levels from around the world. We're not the only jurisdiction that uses 100 
Um, others use rare ones. Uh, other agencies around the world use more storyline black swan type um, design guidance, like what's our worst case scenario. All I'm going to say is a uh, 100 year flood's not not that rare. It's, I'm just going to throw it out there. That's that's as far as I'm willing to go at this point in time. But it's not as rare as what I think. You know, we think it is. Yeah. It'd be interesting to get the insurance industry's view on this. Like at the end of the day, it's a, their bottom pocket, right? It's oh, uh, well, I mean, if if you know, if you're paying, you know, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, how much are you willing to pay for insurance? And that sort of is a pretty good indicator of what risk we're willing to adopt. And um, yeah, I've. Hmm. I was surprised at the frequency of a, what a one in 100 can be, right? So um, it would be interesting to look at some of these flood events we've got around now and um, see how that plotted on there. Um, it's a big challenge for our time, isn't it? But in the end, it's a bit like bushfires. The insurance, in the end, insurers will walk away from certain areas. It'd be mm. good to know what their threshold is. You know? um, so, yes, I guess watch this space on that one. Um, next question, how to factor in climate change variability? For example, high rain, low rain periods into water balance and flood models. Yeah. Um, I think... Um, I guess, you know, in terms of event-based models, you know, we, we have factors for the IFDs. And, and I really wanted to say, again, um, you know, I, I was thinking about, um, like, I managed to squeeze um, $40,000 out of the university to, 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 to look at converting some of the research that we've been doing into, into uh, the antecedent moisture conditions into some sort of loss, loss parameters. Look, it... it there isn't any formal guidance. Um, translating um, these things into guidance is 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 difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to say like it is sort of like a um, you know watch this space. I mean, in terms of water balance, like it is. There's a really good argument, um, and apologies that this is sort of going on off a bit of a tangent. Like the thing is. If you've got a flood model, you've got to factor your rainfall up and you, you know your losses down, right? Um, or up, sorry, you know, because it's it's drier and 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 the guidance is, you know, it, it's hard to translate the research into guidance, but it's it's getting there. With with the this is where there's a really good argument for continuous simulation because um, Australia has the most variable climate in the world. There's 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 so many papers written about this. Um, it is, you know. In the UK, it's just wet, and then when it rains, it parts. Whereas we have these really long dry periods, really long wet periods, like what we're experiencing now. And and the only way to sort of capture all that variability is to do continuous simulation. So you know, stochastically simulate 100 years of data and, and run that through a, a water balance model. But it's it's hard to to get um long long record lengths that that, that are um realistic. But really, that's the answer to the question is to use continuous simulation. But continuous simulation has its own um, issues and, and statistical assumptions as well, and it's not as um, it's not as robust as doing uh, flood modeling. It's, it's just um, yeah, not a very. I'm not a. I feel like I'm just doom and gloom. Anyway, that's good. I mean, I, I guess I would add to the to that and just say, um, in terms of the water balance, I mean, obviously the Bureau of Meteorology is already doing that with their mm. L calculations yeah. so climate change projections into that and dpi new south wales have done a uh, probably a higher resolution mapping of that um at i'm trying to remember the name of the model i've lost it out of the side of my head but um it's it's pretty impressive too so their resolution from dpi new south wales is down to uh one kilometre versus Aura L, which I think is five yeah. kilometre basis. So um, it's improving all the time. So if you wanted to look at how they factor it in, um, there's plenty of information, uh, DPI New South Wales, in how they've utilised um, 
projections to come up with that water balance going forward. Um, next question. I am studying nature-based solutions for flood management in my PhD, half a year in, and want to learn more about this area. Yeah, so I think I just want to go back. Yeah, if, if you're interested in that, um, what, what Richard mentioned, it's um, that ORL. I think if you Google Australian Water Outlook, I think AWO, I think it will take you to that website. And yeah, I, I can't oh, I can't commend that work um, more. So thanks. Uh, thanks for reminding me of that. Um, yeah, there's a PhD student here at the University of Melbourne who's around the same time in that I'm chairing, looking at nature-based solutions. Um, it's a all I can say on that is it is it is a, an emerging area. Um, you have picked a very good research topic. I I think there's a lot of interest in it. Um, one of the hurdles in nature-based solutions is um, their adoption. I, I think they're they're really great at um, mitigating small small floods and improving the health of waterways. And it's just a matter of um, yeah, get, getting um, getting research out there that encourages people to to adopt them and, and quantifying their, their their benefits. I think. So just a little bit more on that. So uh, there's a few things. Um, perhaps if you just send me an email, I can connect you up with some people in this area. The Malone Institute have um, are doing extensive work in this area and they have got some really large uh, monitoring sites as well that we're involved in. Um, it's called the Malone Rehydration Initiative, but they have a wealth of um, ecological data as well as hydrological data. Um, and also the work we're doing with DPI in New South Wales is sort of whole of New South Wales study of where these sorts of things can be applied. Admittedly, that's more sort of around leaky weir structures, but um, some good people we could connect you with in that area. So I suggest give us an email and we'll uh, hook you up with those people. Next question. Oh, the other thing about uh, just getting back to that uh, modelling that the Bureau's done, if you just wanted to have a look on our website at the webinar that Paul Fakema uh, presented on, he provides background to that modelling. So it'd be worth you having a look at that. So just go to our website and uh, you'll find a link to the webinars and um, that'll be in there as one of the recordings. Next question, key questions for community engagement in establishing levels of service for drainage infrastructure. So I, um, again, there's, um, uh, there's quite a few uh, students here and, and researchers who look at community engagement and I'm not gonna do justice at all, but they, um, and I'd be curious to hear other people's experience, but it turns out, I'm not sure that my impression from from their presentations, I'm probably not doing it justice, is that um, it's not really about necessarily always key questions. It's it's really about um, just taking people on the journey with you. And what's been really interesting that they found is that actually um, the community are pretty smart. So so you can actually um, you know really communicate uh, what you're doing with them um, in in detail. Um, you don't have to worry about dumbing things down. Um, they, they want information. And, and yeah, and if, you, and if you engage them early, generally the outcomes are, are really positive. So, yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Richard. Well, it's just interesting to see the progression over the last 30 years, you know. So I remember when the catchment management uh, approach first came out and there was a lot of um, community engagement around that and a lot of farmers and the like participated in that and came up with some unique approaches for managing flooding and that sort of thing in those catchments. A model similar to that might need to be applied more to the urban environment. Now we're moving into this sort of more peaky sort of event and it's I guess it's coming to town, isn't it? Right. So well, a similar think, approach, really. Yeah, you just you just made me realise. I think one of the things that has come out um, that I've noticed from from the literature I've been reading, I think I think there is a sense of um, and whether this helps with with forming the questions is there's sort of a the sense of fault is a false sense of security um, around um, infrastructure. Um, so often when we see um, a levy or you know, I mean, I, I appreciate a levy might not 
necessarily be the type of infrastructure that you're referring to in this question. But when we think about a levy, we see it and we're like, oh yeah, oh, we're safe. <laughs> but you know, you know, it's only safe for a certain um, size of event, and usually that size isn't that that large. Um, so I think there's just a huge level of a false sense of security, and and we're not always communicating. I think, you know, how um, the actual actual risk. Um, yeah. Which really comes back to that question: What design events should we be using to design structures and systems? It seems it should be a good debate around that at some stage. Um, better keep moving. Uh, we're well over time, but we will. We've got nine questions in the Q and A, and one more here. So, if everyone's willing to hang on, or more importantly, if Conrad is, we will um, continue. I, I I talk too much. Um, so yeah, but now I'm happy to hang on. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> How would the climate change affect the rationale formula in computing for peak discharge? So two things I'll say. I think, um, so we've moved to this uh, RFFE, I think, from the, um, if you do the drop down um, in the ARNR data hub um, to calculate, um, yeah, rather than using the rational formula, but I appreciate that the rational formula is used in, in urban design, and I think you just factor up the, the intensities, really. So, yeah. Okay, good answer. On to today's questions. So it just highlights uh, the importance of early bird questions. <laughs> um, Giuseppe, one of our favourite attendees at these webinars, Giuseppe from Z Melbourne Zoo. According to the flu's risk and the time horizon years, is there any local regional toolkit or guideline that can be used to build infrastructure that most likely will face extreme events? Yeah, I, I, my, my understanding, and this is where, like, you know, I haven't been a practicing engineer in a while. Um, Floods risk, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, there are, you know, different, Depending on the class of infrastructure, there's there's a different um, there's a different level of risk that you that you design to, and you know it doesn't necessarily explicitly say like how long your your infrastructure is going to survive for, but you know depending on how critical your infrastructure is, then then the level of risk that it's designed for is is rarer and and rarer. And I think there's local guidance, um, you know, or, or you know. From local guidance to state guidance, um, different jurisdictions have their own guidance around these things. If that's my, that's my understanding. Okay. Now we have a chap. Not sure if I'm going to get the pronunciation right. Said Mir Aga Manawi from Afghanistan, and he's an assistant professor at the engineering faculty. Paktia Uni, I am looking for a PhD position in water resource or environment. Is there any opportunity? Who should he get in touch with, do you think? Well, I think, yeah, I, I want to say, I know this is, I don't want to um, be like um, directing you to a website, but, but the reality is that, yeah, if you keep on top of university websites, they continue to um, advertise PhD opportunities. I know that with the One Basin um, CRC, uh, there'll be advertisements coming out from the University of Melbourne um, advertising for PhD students. So, you know, it, it really is about getting onto those mailing lists so that, um, yeah, you, you can take, um, yeah, great, take take those opportunities when, 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 when they're advertised. Um, there isn't any, the unfortunate thing is there's no usually specific time when these things are advertised. So it's just sort of about monitoring um, the relevant channels. Okay, so hop online is the answer there. Um, next question from Bizard Jamali. Is any of climate change impact somehow accounted for in the ARR 2019 IFDs, given it is using more recent data. So I hope you can. Um, oh, no. Okay. My, my laptop is running out of screen. Is 
Sorry, Conrad, yeah. you're breaking up a fair bit there. You might want to start again. Yeah, apologies. Um, okay, I think I think it's we're back. Um, yeah, I mean the, the answer is yes. Um, if there's non-stationarity in there and, and you've um, and use more updated data, then it is in some way in there um, by, by default. But um, that it you know uh, the IFDs would be an average of the entire record. So if there's climate change that's happened very recently, it wouldn't be. Um, yeah, it's weighted towards the entire record. So it's it's uh, it's in there, but it's um, it's only an average of what's happened over the, the record length that they that has been used. Okay. Oops, so I've scrolled past. Sorry. Matt Taylor. My takeaway is that rare rain events are likely to get more extreme but the type of rain event is likely to be short duration. Long duration rain events are reducing. So future risks are likely to be extreme microburst type storms, question. My understanding is that those style events have increased runoff despite soil moisture as the pressure head required to drive deeper soil percolation is generally too high not to mention the increased urbanisation increasing impervious areas in the first place. Are future flood risks primarily going to be flash floods, basically? Um, yeah, so I, I think that's spot on. So there, there is definitely, um, yes, particularly because all the, it's, it's really important to note that um, most research that we do is using, say, the HWS um, data that, Richard, um, you, you presented. Um, it's in rural areas right so yeah in, in urban areas flood risk will will increase that's that's spot on everything there is absolutely spot on and the only caveat that i would have is that yeah if you move to more localized um uh, short rainfalls but in you know in very large catchments um then well you know by the time that that reaches the the um the, the river system then then that won't necessarily translate into uh, an increase but otherwise yeah that's, that's spot on, yeah. Okay, Syed has sent his email through. I'll forward that on. Um, anonymous attendee, agree that consideration of historical data is incredibly important and often not adequately considered. However, warming climate leading to atmospheric rivers and stalling weather systems are resulting in unprecedented flood events. Could Lismore have been anticipated? One in 10,000 plus question. Surely we have to at least plan for historical worst case plus more and transfer of similar setup to Lismore happening in other locations. Yeah, uh, uh, that's, yeah that's a really, Really good question. I like the, the the Bureau of Meteorology is is actively doing research to to look at um, how weather systems are changing. There is, there is evidence that um, that weather systems are changing in a way where they're exactly stalling. They're they're, they're slower, so they dump more rainfall. Um, yeah, look, it's um, but the, the second bit of that question goes to like, what are you designed for? You know, and and, and that's that's. You know, do you design for the black swan event or do you design based on um, some sort of probabilistic risk threshold? I, there's, there's no real easy easy answers to, to, those, to those questions. Perhaps you could answer a question for me, Conrad. Um, whose job is that to set that level? Yeah, I don't. That's a really good question. Um, mm. If anyone out there still on uh, this knows that, <laughs> who's, that's, who's, that's... in the Q&A, it would seem that hooking yourself up with those people would uh, fulfil your dreams of more applied science. Um, I mean, yeah, I I was always under the impression there was like state government authorities that set um, flood flood planning levels, but I, um, you know, I'm happy to show my ignorance if I'm wrong. Yeah, I think it's really important we find that out. So I might take that one on notice and see if we can work out who sets. Design thresholds. I mean, it's 
obviously sits in an Australian standard or something. But, um, must be some civil engineers still hanging on the webinar. Um, last question, and thanks everybody for hanging around. It's um, and particularly yourself, Conrad. How to measure flood resilience at the regional level after extreme flood events like West Germany 2021 flood? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. With with well, I mean that's. I think really these things are all related, Conrad, right? So you you can, uh, if you set a threshold uh, for what you design to, then that's probably a level of resilience, right? Yeah, and, and you know, there is, um, again, there's there's good argument for, um, oh, good argument. Um, look, we, we're getting better at um, disaster preparedness. We, we, our emergency responses are, are quicker, so... Yeah, we are definitely becoming more resilient to to flooding in terms of you know there's less loss of life. But um, yeah, I, I I think you're right, Richard. It's um yeah, it's, it's a lot of these answers are in well, what what do we design for? Um, All right. Well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I'd really like to. Thank yourself, Conrad, for a fantastic presentation. And also thank you everyone for such a good set of questions there at the end. So many thanks for your time and also to Melbourne University. Uh, really appreciate your contribution. And I hope you enjoyed it, Conrad. Thank you. No, thanks so much for having me.